Some breaking news now. UCI Cycling's governing body, Ben Armstrong for life. And Marion Jones, he would store steroids in the refrigerator. I have no one to blame but myself. Over the years, scientific progress has made it easier and faster to detect athletes who dope. But it's also helped make it easier to dope. Few are caught. So what's the real story behind doping in sport? Just explain to me what anti-doping agencies are up against. So what, they have, what are they yeah, for? they have an impossible task, essentially, which is looking for a huge list of substances and then looking for the invisible. The classic ways of doping are using anabolic steroids. That's that's really what um, it started with. But it's not the most refined way of, of doping. So then on top of that, you have human growth hormones are still being used. And it's gotten a lot more sophisticated now. Um, blood doping, we were talking about it. Um, so EPO, which is a drug that thickens your blood and so um, increases the, the number of red blood cells in your system. And that oxygenates your muscles. Every day, essentially, there's a new set of drugs that are being designed, or a new set of combinations and cocktails that are being designed. Science has always played catch-up to the ways athletes and coaches avoid detection of drugs in sport. For most of the history of anti-doping, the focus was on trying to identify particular chemicals in urine. We went to talk to James Tozer, who writes about sport here at The Economist, to find out how the science has moved on. About 10 years ago, they were introduced something called the Athlete Biological Passport. And the aim there is not to find specific substances, but rather to look for unusual changes in the composition of an athlete's blood. For as long as the Olympics have existed, athletes have cheated. But it's only since the International Olympic Committee started testing for doping in 1968 that the cheaters have been officially caught. The game changed in 2004 with the introduction of a biobank, allowing the storage and retesting of athlete samples over an eight-year period. Then, in 2009, came biological passports. Since then, more than 200 athletes have been caught doping. But that's not the full picture. The passports were sort of seen as this sort of silver bullet, you know, this, this magic solution, uh, and, it, and it hasn't delivered that, you're still getting you know, maybe one to two percent of, of tests are positive and you know there are lots of athletes who have, have continued to compete during the era of the passports and haven't been caught. In an anonymous survey at the 2011 World Athletics Championships, an astonishing 44 percent of athletes admitted to doping within the last year. But typically only one to two percent of samples test positive. And most doping has in fact been detected years after it happened. And had it not been for the admissions of two Russian whistleblowers and other intelligence, many of those cases could still be unknown. <laughs> Ali Jawad is a British Paralympian and former world champion weightlifter. I'm an athlete first and foremost, and athletes deserve to have clean sport, fair play, and they deserve to be protected. As an outspoken critic of doping in sport, we wanted to hear Ali's take on how big the gap might be between doping and its detection. And right now, the system is still not optimal for athletes. We want to catch maybe one or two percent, right? I honestly, honestly think that um, we're, we're looking at maybe 30 or 40 percent. That's why I think they're so backwards um, in the way they te the test out data as well. Um, that, that, that's why I keep pushing about, if you only catch one or two percent, then how many keen athletes are missing out on these medals? So why have biological passports not lived up to their promise as the way to stamp out doping? And what's the alternative? There's a scientist in the south of England who seems to have an answer. So we headed to Brighton to meet him. The athlete biological passport system is a very clever concept. Its weakness at the moment is it's that it's based on a handful of biomarkers, compounds within the body that reflect uh, the fact uh, that there's been a change in one's red blood cells, for example. But it's very, very clear that a large number are evading detection because the, the markers can also be easily, easy manipulated. And, what, and that's going to separate out... Yanis Pitsiladis uh, is on the Medical and Scientific Commission of the IOC the International Olympic Committee. 
He spent more than a decade honing a new method to spot blood doping. It's an approach that might eventually be used to test and help stamp out doping of any kind. Will they have stored it as whole blood? As whole blood. Yeah, but how much do they have? Do you know? So what we are pioneering here in this laboratory is trying to utilize newer technologies like these gene chip technologies where we can, where we can look at every single gene that's switched on and off in the human body to see whether we can use this approach to the detection of drugs in sport. Yanis plans to add thousands of biomarkers through genetic sequencing. There are around 21,000 genes in the body. Several hundred switch on when an athlete takes a blood thickening drug or has a blood transfusion. And this changes the athlete's genetic signature. By analyzing these changes, which can be detected weeks, possibly even months later, Yanis can spot blood doping, the method used, and even roughly when it took place. But the final stage of Yanis's research could be the most challenging. It'll be labor intensive and time consuming, require access to a DNA sequencer and a supercomputer, and it will cost an estimated four million pounds. I must acknowledge that I'm one of the, the most funded scientists in anti-doping, and I'm extremely frustrated. So far, Yanis has secured over half a million pounds from sponsors and WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, and a Chinese company has agreed to lend him a sequencer. Let's demonstrate, even in a small way, that we can detect one athlete scientifically. I'm confident that this is the way forward. Yanis's struggle to secure funding is typical of the wider challenge facing anti-doping researchers. It's very clear to me that WADA needs more money. And the question is, where is that money going to come from? What really struck us when we talked to Yanis wasn't just the science, it was this funding gap. Organisations that say that they want to rid sport of doping haven't always put their money where their mouth is. So we've made another film to find out why and to untangle the politics around the world's foremost anti-doping agency. We need to understand that WADA as an institution is weak. There was resistance from the Olympic movement where there was a desire to have more control. It's basically a naked legislator. It produces rules that it has absolutely no power and capacity to enforce. To learn more about WADA, the IOC, and the structural challenges in stopping doping, watch the rest of our film by clicking on the link opposite. You can click on the other link if you like to read some of our resources. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe.